I'm Mel Stewart, and this is the Swim Swam Podcast, our Olympic coverage. And today we have a superstar. We have the man with the deep knowledge, with the expertise, a man who has won the 400 IM at the Olympic level back to back 1996 and in 2000. Today we have Tom Dolan. No, no, Mel, cheer. thanks for having me. Good to be with you guys. <laughs> So I'm just going to shut my mouth and I, I want to hear your thoughts on this race. Yeah, there's a lot to unpack, right? I mean, I think to your point, um, the last 24 hours or so uh, made this conversation, uh, I would say, uh, more complex. Uh, def- certainly has a lot more layers to it than, uh, than we probably thought. If, you know, if I said to who comes in, does this thing, goes four or six something, uh, this is a whole different conversation, right? Which I think... You guys thought, I certainly thought that. Um, I love Chase. Uh, you know, uh, certainly he was kind of tugging at the heartstrings uh, for all of us to, to pull through. Um, you know, as you pointed out, redemption story, silver last Olympics, um, gold this Olympics, bring back the, the gold for the U.S. and the 4 a.m. That, that we've held on to for a long time until Kasuki took it down, uh, you know, in 16. And um but, but here's the thing, and, and I'm not saying this isn't true in all events, um, but at this level, the 400 IM, there's a lot of uh, strategy and, and experience that's required to strategically pull off a, a, a proper, a correct, even maybe a borderline perfect 400 IM. But there's also not a lot of mystery at this level in terms of who can go to what level of bar in terms of time, right? You're just not, you're not going to have somebody that was 20th in the world rip a 405. It's too hard of an event, quite frankly, right? It's just not really how it works unless something fishy is going on. And so I think a lot of the swim nerd side of us, right? We look at that and say, you know, Kazuki goes uh, 406 and 16. Uh, Diaceto's been 406. Granted, the last two, three years, it's hard to it's hard to break that down real time. But I more looked at it simplistically of what is your what is your top line, your fifth gear? What time what time range can that bring you? Right? Are, do you do you have the the speed and strength and and proper strategy to get into that four hundred five, four hundred six, or not? Right? Or are you more in that four hundred eight, four hundred nine? I think what we're saying. Uh, from a time perspective, as we saw 406-ish as that gold medal, right? I certainly did. I think if anybody, you know, going into yesterday said 409 is going to win the gold medal, w- we would all say, I don't even think that's going to medal, right? And so it's a tricky one to talk about, right? And, and Mel, here's where I'm torn, right? I, I'm, I'm wearing this hat on purpose because that's what I believe, just like you do, right? And so um, I almost feel like there, this is an apology conversation to have because we just freaking went one, two. OK, and, and I hope everyone around the world watches this. So I, I don't want to play the, the incorrect NBC role of just talking about Americans because this was a fantastic race. I love the fact that like the data nerds out there could dig in and say, hey, when was the last Olympics that a Hungarian wasn't in the final in the 4 a.m.? Just a super cool stat. Right. Love that stuff. Love the Tunisian kid winning the 400 free sticking to the four I am. But my point is like, you, you almost have to apologize a little bit because we just went one, two. Was that kind of feel of w- what just happened? Like, are those times right? And, and I'd love, I'd love for us to dig into that in a little bit too, of like why that might be. But I think, you know, the Diaceto thing is, it is, I certainly can speak to personally um, having won the four I am in Atlanta um, and, and like Chase last night, my 4 a.m. gold was the very first gold medal for the U.S. team, which is not really something truthfully you even know to dream about, but it is a really cool happenstance, right? Um, I really feel for Diaceto as, as an aside because um, I thought he, you know, I, I, I thought he, ha- he obviously had it in his grasp. Um, a lot of pressure. Um, I didn't see any quotes uh, from him about the pressure, but certainly that has that has something to do with it in front of your your home crowd 
Um, so, you know, I think there is a lot to unpack. Um, I think the positives are Litherland, as we know he can do, gets in there for, for silver. Reminded me a little bit of Eric Vent um, and, and how he did his job in 2000 with me and in 04 with Michael. Um, so a really cool moment for the, for the men's team to start off that way. But certainly um, we're all perplexed a bit by, by over all the times. We're going we're gonna to talk about Carson Foster and the long shadow that he created with his with his swim on Friday night at the Speedo sectional meet, dropping a 4.084. And just so we have some context on that, when we get to that topic, we'll, we'll break down the splits. We'll compare his, his Olympic trials, best swim, which is the prelim, not the final. In the final, we got third, obviously not making the Olympic team. We'll compare those splits from the Olympic trials to his swim at Speedo sectionals. Let's talk, let's, let's bring the conversation to where you had it, which is the perfect storm. Because what happens is that we talk about times right now and swim nerds will talk about times for years, but the truth is eventually it all sort of falls away and you just remember the color of the metal. And, and so this is what led us up to this moment. The perfect storm was, um, yes, Chase pu pulls on the heartstrings. Chase is a 4.059 at the 2017 World Championships. Something's wrong with Chase uh, at a certain point after that, and he doesn't talk about it. Super private person. I think that Michael Phelps probably advised him to keep his mouth shut, and he didn't. But among close friends, he shared that he had serious shoulder problems. And, and because of that, a lot of us in the background, when I was talking to our staff at Swim Time, I was like, I don't think that Chase is going gonna, is gonna to be there. I can't tell you why, but there's a, there's a reason why. And if you knew it, you would, you'd have a little compassion. It seemed like the perfect storm begins here. Pandemic gives this athlete time to heal. Um, we have the rising star of, of uh, Carson Foster, who a lot of people are picking to do well at trials. And Carson Foster, in my opinion, like to know what you, what you think, didn't quite get the rest he needed and swam a bad race, probably from inexperience and being young. Perfect storm. Also, Diaseto moving into the Olympic Games where he would have a hometown crowd, but because of COVID and the state that that nation's in with, with the vaccinations, no fans at the Olympic arena. And also this outlier thing that we, we don't consider, which is that uh, in Japan right now, they don't want the Olympic Games. No, no matter what anyone says, every single poll shows that they did not want the Olympic Games. So there's shame surrounding the Olympic Games. What's the impact there? So I'm thinking about that perfect storm. Do you have anything to add to that? You know, I think that, um, I mean, I would add the simple fact of what the heck happened the last 18, 20 plus months in terms of training cycles, right? And, oh, by the way, the 4IM is really hard. Uh, so you have to train really hard and at a lot of different levels and capacity, right? I think incorrectly, people always think, oh, it's, you've got to train those aerobic energy systems, right? Sure. I mean, you have to have a baseline of, of, of aerobic training and be in shape. Yes, correct. However, you're still doing a hundred of each stroke. You have to have strength and speed to shift gears, right? And, and I talk a lot about shifting gears in a 4IM to swim it precisely, um, you've got to know exactly down to five to 10 to 15 meter increments within that hundred when you're going to kind of just yoke the field. Right. And that's a lot of how I would look at it. Um, for, for anyone that, that knows me, which is probably not many anymore since I'm, I'm old. Um, but that was a lot of my mentality. I had a very aggressive competitive mentality. Um, and, and that's how I'm wired. But I think strategically within that, I would add the COVID training has a, uh, I think a significant kind of um, a deep impact, not just on, well, it's hard to get pool time. And so maybe I didn't get my yards in, right? But I think you also have to think of it from the standpoint of specifically, uh, if your weak stroke is backstroke, did you get enough of your fly to back transition back to breast transition in, right? Did you have the time to really dial in granularly to no, no, actually what I want to work on is the first 15 meters off of my backstroke turn so that I start to ride higher going into my breaststroke, right? I mean, there, I, I could go on for, you know, hours on 
on strategy of where I would, I would mix that up. And sometimes I would purposely do it different in prelims than I did in finals, just to mess with everyone in the field, right? If I saw that somebody clearly said, okay, my strategy is to attack time here, then I would totally screw with them, right? And I would lay off my backstroke and then I would jump my breaststroke. So by finals, they're going, now I don't know where to go, right? And I think all of that is time. All of that is you need training time to mess with that and do 75s instead of 50s or 125s instead of 100s. And, um, and, and that type of, of getting to the detail, I think it's fair to say everybody probably missed, would have loved, right? Mel, you and I can speak to this and that we're super fortunate that we can now say, yes, in my Olympic lead up, here's what I worked on. Very hard to kind of have that perspective and, and say, yeah, it's a different beast, right? And so what do you want your perfect lead up to be? Um, what I find interesting in the what you said too, to add on to is the year, which I completely agree with, by the way, um, when ironically, I think the theme of, of most of the Olympic events is going to be the year, the, the extra year hurt the veterans and helped the rookies, right? It gave Tory Husk, hometown bias, Arlington, Yorktown High School, uh, it gave that, that extra year to get stronger, to get smarter, right? To get, to, to have some experience under a belt that doesn't just have to be racing. It's just life on the planet of, of I can do this, right? Um, so it's ironic in this race that, that that year actually probably helped some of those veterans because I agree with you that it, it probably did, those that were dinged up a bit. I would argue for Diaceto, it was the worst thing that could possibly happen because while I agree with you that there's a funkiness of Japan now, kind of almost like shaming, as you said. But I think the other thing is when you carry that, what feels like 1 million pounds of extra weight on your shoulders because you are the person going into the Olympics. Well, everyone else could fail, but diaceto has got the gold. So we're good there, right? An extra year ain't good to carry that, right? And, and, I, and I don't know him, right? But I'm just saying, having been in that place, uh, you want to just get to it. You do not want to extend that lead up longer. So I think that certainly plays a role in all this too. A lot of people have asked me, what do you think about the fans? You know, I, I don't know how you feel about this, Mel. I, sure, it's on my list. In fact, I wrote down my four or five things that I think play a role, not just in this race, but in all this. The fans is on there, but it's last on every version of my list. Um, and the reason I say that just doing audience to, to kind of understand this side of it is I think for every athlete, this probably varies um, a, a, a tiny bit from, from one to another in terms of impact. But look, let's not forget that at the end of the day, um, this is I'm a big golf fan. This is not golf. They don't they don't. Oh, the, the, there was no crowd at the Masters, but the U.S. Open the PGA Championship and the British Open were good, and those are all a month apart from each other, right? This is this is four years, right? It was five years this cycle. Um, there is there is really no outside motivation that that is needed for an athlete that's wired the way an Olympic athlete is wired, right? And 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 I find this to be an interesting topic because I happen to be super lucky. Had nothing to do with it. Just was very lucky that. I competed in, in, in my home uh, country. And then I competed in the country in 2000 that literally swimming is, is it. It's the, it's the main thing. You couldn't have a more frenzied crowd uh, <clears throat> at Sydney Olympic Stadium, right? Which I loved because they were cheering against us because they just smashed the guitars the night before. Like I credit them for breaking the world record, not my training, right? That's why I sat on the lane rope dropping the FU bomb, right? Because it's the greatest, it's the greatest thing that ever happened to me. Um, so, so I'm actually one that I love that. Right. But, but would I honestly tell you that I wouldn't have performed without, no way. Like, are you kidding me? We, we work way too hard for how to have that be such a major impact. Now, if you're the home country to your point, does that have an effect? Absolutely. Right. Cause that's what you're geared for. Um, but I think it is interesting on those two points, almost, you know, prioritize further in terms of the COVID impact in this race in that list and I would push the other one down a little bit more in terms of the fans. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcast on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.